so b scales the amplitude of the wave function. Without it, however, we can still examine some broad trends that the solution tells us. The figure on the left plots the individual solutions to psi of x when n is equal to 1, 2, 3, and 4. The energies in this figure are expressed with h instead of h bar, but both are equivalent. Notice that the energy increases with n and only occurs at discrete or quantized levels. On the right is a plot of psi star psi, denoted the absolute value of psi of x squared. These are probability distribution functions, depending again on the value of n. Take note that it is not equally likely for the particle to be found everywhere in the box. There are regions where the probability of finding the particle goes to zero. This is strikingly different from the classical case where we're used, we are used to where if we were to randomly sample a ball moving back and forth in a box, it would be equally likely to find it anywhere. Another really striking result from this problem is that quantization of energy falls out naturally. By simply employing the wave equation with boundary conditions to describe the particle, its energy is quantized according to h squared n squared over 8ma squared, where n is a positive integer. In this case, n could be called a quantum number. Recall that when Planck and Bohr employed quantization to solve for black body spectra and the hydrogen atom spectrum, they deliberately inserted it so that their model matched experimental reality. This was not necessary here, and this result further cemented the idea of quantization as a valid one. Alright, so let's apply this energy level solution that we just found for the particle in a box to a real life example so we can see how effective it is as a description of reality. So we're going to look at this molecule butadiene and we can draw it simply as a conjugated carbon-carbon chain that has four carbons in it. And in this case I'm going to explicitly write in double bonds and single bonds just to make this a simpler problem to solve. And so we're going to make a couple of assumptions. The first one is, is that we have four pi electrons that are moving across the four carbon atoms, which means that this is the box that these four electrons are trapped in, and that box is basically has a length of about 5.78 angstroms, where one angstrom is equal to 10 to the minus 10 meters. We're going to assume that it's a linear molecule so that all we need to do to come up with this 5.78 number is we're just adding up the distances for all of these carbon-carbon bonds. So that just means that this carbon-carbon single bond that's typically has a distance of about 1.54 angstroms. These carbon-carbon double bonds, they typically have distances of 1.35 angstroms. And then of course, since that carbon-carbon double bond comes to just to the center of the carbon atom, we have to add on half of the diameter of a carbon atom, 0.78 or 77 angstroms. We have this length as 1.35 again, and then we have another 0.77. So then the summation of all of these distances is what gives us this 5.78 angstroms. So again, we have 2 times 0 0.77 plus 2 times 1.35 plus 1.54. And that gives us the total length of our box, in this case the total length of the molecule, which is 5.78 angstroms. And so our claim is that the total energy of each electron can be described using this relationship that we just calculated a second ago. And really, the version that we calculated a second ago was this E is equal to h bar squared n squared pi squared over 2ma squared. And so to get this relationship to the one that I have written into the problem, we just have to remember that h bar, which is called the reduced Planck's constant, is just equal to h divided by 2 pi. So if I take that if I take h bar and I just explicitly plug that right into my equation, what I'm going to get is an energy term that now has h squared over 4 pi squared, and that's going to be multiplied by n squared pi squared over 2m a squared. And so if I do my canceling out, I can cancel out my pi's. I multiply 4 by 2 and I end up with h squared n squared over 8 m a squared. And in this case, for this problem, this mass, well that's just the mass of the electron. Since we're talking about electrons moving around 
inside our molecule. So the final point in this example or in this problem setup is this one, that we can only put two electrons in each energy level. And this is something that we know as the Pauli exclusion principle, which we'll talk about a little bit later. But that just means that we can create an energy diagram that looks something like this. And I'm just going to draw three lines because I only need to have three levels. Here is my first energy level when I set n is equal to 1 for my energy relationship, which is something that we've already talked about right here, this h squared, n squared, 8 MeA squared. So again, n is a quantized number. It's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, any positive integer. And so then basically what that represents is just this series of lines that I can write in where I can say I have the n is equal to 1 energy level, n is equal to 2 energy level, and n is equal to 3 energy level. And inside my butadiene, I have 4 pi electrons, so I can populate my energy levels. Here are 2 electrons sitting inside my n is equal to 1 energy level, and here are 2 electrons sitting in the n is equal to 2 energy level. And of course we're saying that the problem is what's asking is determine the lowest frequency of a photon required to excite the ground state of butadiene, and right here in my energy level diagram, which is what I have drawn down here, I have my ground state of butadiene. All my electrons are in the lowest possible energy configuration that they can possibly be. But again, the question is asking, I'm going to send in a photon, so this is my packet of light, h nu, some energy, and that what that's going to do is that that's going to hit this electron sitting in the n is equal to 2 energy level, and it's going to excite it to the n is equal to 3 energy level. And so the question is asking, what is that frequency? What is this, this new value that we need for the, the, the photon so that it would then do that excitation? Well, to know that value, all we need to do or what we need to start with knowing is basically what is the energy separation between these two energy levels. And then based on that, then we know the total energy of the photon that needs to come in and then from that, we can then solve for the frequency. So let's start with finding out what is this delta E between these two energy levels. And that's actually a very straightforward thing to say, because we know that the delta E, the change in energy, that's just equal to the final energy minus the initial energy. Well, the final energy in this case, and I'm going to borrow from this relationship again, where I'm going to use this because that's the energy of each energy level. I'm going to have h squared. The final is the n is equal to 3 energy level, so I'm just going to write 3 squared divided by 8 m e a squared. And remember, a is the length of my box, and that is this 5.78 times 10 to the minus 10 meters, because that's the length of the box itself. That's the length of the conjugated uh, molecule that we're looking at for butadiene. And from that, I'm going to subtract off the energy from the initial state, and the initial state is the n is equal to 2 energy level. So again, I'm just going to write h squared times 2 squared, all divided by 8 me 5.78 times 10 to the minus 10. And sorry, I should have had squares on both of those terms. This has now become a problem or an exercise of substituting in variables and now just solving for the number itself. So I'm going to distribute out all the common factors here. So I've got h squared, so that's 6.626 times 10 to the minus 34. That value is squared. I'm going to divide that by 8 times the mass of the electron, 1.90 or 109 times 10 to the minus 31. I'm going to multiply that by the width of the box, 5.78 times 10 to the minus 10 squared. And with that, I'm just going to multiply that by 9 minus 4. When I plug all these numbers into my calculator, the number that you will get, the energy of the photon that's required to promote that electron, 9.02 times 10 to the minus 19 joules. So remember, this number, which we just calculated, this is the energy separation between the two energy levels, the n is equal to 2 and the n is equal to 3 energy level. But again, this is also, therefore, the energy of the photon that's required to then promote that electron between those two energy levels. That means then I can make that number directly equal to h nu, which is the energy of a photon. So then if we do that calculation, what we end up with is 9.02 times 10 to the minus 19 divided by Planck's constant 6.626 times 10 to the minus 34. And that gives me a frequency of this photon to be equal to 1.36 times 10 
to the 15 hertz. Now that number may not mean too much to us because it's hard for us to imagine what a frequency of a, of a wave or of light is supposed to be, so let's convert it to a wavelength. We do that by just saying that the speed of light c is equal to lambda times nu. Well, the speed of light, that's 2.998 times 10 to the 8 meters per second, divided by this frequency that we just calculated, 1.36 times 10 to the 15, and that equals to the wavelength. So our wavelength that we calculate is 2.20 times 10 to the minus 7 meters, or written in nanometers, that's 220 nanometers. So the color of that light is going to be very blue. In fact, it's probably a bit into the UV range. Now the thing that we want to take away from this, and sort of the power of this model, is that if we actually were to measure the spectra, the actual number that we should get from this, or that we measure, is actually 217 nanometers. So that means, based on this very simple model of the atom where we made a, quite a few um, simplifications, we ended up with a calculated number that is very close to the actual uh, measured number. This model, you're applying this model, is called something called the free electron model. And basically, we can use it to explain certain parts of spectra. Where we could say that we have electrons trapped in infinite square potentials, just moving back and forth, and that the promotion and demotion of these electrons through their energy levels then relate to the color of light that is either required to excite it or the color of light that is emitted once it relaxes.